Welcome to the Clifton Whirly Show. This week we have the Whirly Birds, Josh and Nick with us, and we have a special guest, Albert Mills. What's up, Albie? How's it going, man? Happy to be here today. Yeah, it, it's a thrill. Um, now, I'm going to have you tell us a little bit about yourself, Albert, but uh, you're with Sonosoid, right? Oh, yeah, I am. Soid yeah. boys. Yeah. <laughs> That that they are one of my favorite companies, I believe, um, because I guess it's like one of the few gear companies like that I I know almost the entire staff. I've met them at this point, you know, and um, it's really cool. Um, I got to hang out with um, Andy some last year, and then uh, was with Anthony at Summer Naom, and I, I believe I met you there as well. And then um, you came to, out to, we just got, all got back from winter now, and you were there and got to hang out with you a few times. And um, so this is going to be kind of a very nam centric um, episode. We're kind of going to cover, um, yeah, what our, what our, um, what we observe from nam and some of our impressions there and, um, I'm going to talk about some of the new gear. And then also, Nick and Josh, I want you, your guys' opinion on uh, some of the coverage that you saw and, and what, what piqued your interest. And uh, we'll kind of just uh, have a discussion about that for a little while. But um, before we get into that, I just want to ask you guys um, kind of what's what's new, what's going on with you guys. Uh, Josh, you want to start? Well, sure, yeah. Um, I... Uh recently got those new pedals that we've been talking about the full tone gt500 and the digital a and boy that digital a um just instantly is the best easiest to use delay i've ever used and it also freed up my alter ego and so what's new for me this week is i've taken my alter ego and i've permanently set it up to be uh feeding back into itself so that um it kind of instantly becomes padding again we kind of talked about this in our first interview clifton um, and, uh, it's just instant ambient machine, which I've been kind of messing more with that, with those ambient sounds this week. Um, what else is new? Oh, I stuck my mixer to the wall <laughs> and I'll post a picture of it in the group. Uh, I don't like it being down. I put it up. So that, that's, what's new with me. Uh, what about you, Nick? Um, I'm going to talk about my, what's new on Mojo minute. I think, I think that'll be, I got a couple things I can talk yeah. about there. Um, and, uh, I'll do it there. Um, although the one of them actually probably doesn't go under the mojo minute, I guess I'll talk about that one. So the, uh, the Ibanez C, I don't know, I, you guys know that I've had a, um, I got an Ibanez CF seven pedal and, uh, it's the coral flange, the seven series, the one that Justin Porter's all crazy about the, they look like concrete blocks or whatever. <laughs> they got some really, really cool settings. Well, I've owned two. I, I owned a pH seven phaser and I owned a CF seven. I sold the pH seven. I shouldn't have. And I've got the, or the PF seven or whatever it is. And I've got the CF seven, the coral flanger. Well, when I got it in reverb, it, the switch didn't really turn on all the time. And I was like, okay, I think I'm going to get, you know, you know, should I send this back or not? And I was like, no, nah, it's probably just an easy, simple fix. And I'm not going to mess with it. It was $35. So I'll just keep it. Well, you know, I'd have to step on it a couple times, to turn it on or step on it a couple times, to turn it off. And it was pretty inconsistent. It was like, sometimes it come right on, sometimes it go with off, right off. And sometimes it wouldn't. Well, um, finally I'm like, well, the switch is just burned out. I don't know how to fix it. I'm going to have a pedal builder fix it. So loophole pedals, um, works on these and uh does some cool rehousings and stuff so i contacted them and i was like can you put in a um can you just like bypass the old switch and put in a new switch craft on the top of it or whatever and drill it out and um you know and they said fine you know well you know i have a 40 dollar bench fee i'm like okay cool can you put a pink led in to match it and he's like yeah i can do that so i sent it to him and he got the switch into it and then it still didn't fix the problem he messaged me back and he's like yeah this thing's still not working and I'm like, well, what's going on with it? And he's apparently Robert Keeley did a bunch of research into that pedal because they kept people kept sending them to fix them. And apparently it's a board issue. Oh, no. And there's nothing you can do about it. <sighs> like he I guess he put hours and hours of bench time into figuring out why these things have this issue. And he never found really anything consistent. And it said the amount of hours put into actually troubleshooting it wasn't worth fixing them. So he doesn't fix them anymore. Oh, and, um, nobody like he won't touch them. So apparently it's just an issue and there's like three boards in this pedal. So it could be like 
a number of things. So I'm pretty much upside down in this pedal now. I've got like, you know, 75 bucks into it and uh, it's not ever going to work right. Yeah. Oh, that's that's a bummer. Yeah. So now I'm just stuck with this pedal that turns on and off at random, you know, and (laughs) unless I like put it in a loop by itself and like leave it on, you know, and then try to try to do that. But I mean, no big deal. I'll play with it around the house and whatnot. But it was kind of a bummer. So that's that's my what's new. I struck out on that one. Oh. That, was, uh, that sucked. So. I feel for you. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, go ahead. Well, Albert, what about you, man? Oh, man. Um, so uh, I was trying to kind of do the whole, you know, take a little bit of a hiatus from buying some new gear. Um, <laughs> but it didn't work. Uh, um <laughs> So a couple weeks ago before NAM, um, I snagged an old Ampeg BT40 combo. Yes, I saw um, that. One of the, oh yeah, 410, it's uh, like 60 watts, I want to say. Um, probably weighs as much as I do, if not a little bit more. <laughs> um, <it's, laughs> I mean, that thing is insane. Really awesome, super loud, uh, clean pedal platform kind of thing. And anybody who knows me pretty well, and I guess now at this point, anybody who uh, follows the Sinusoid Instagram knows that I'm a huge Big Ear NYC fan. Mm. And I finally have a woodcutter coming on the way, oh, which man. is Grant's uh, rat style circuit. Um, and I mean, Grant's kind of like a true expert in rats. He He's had like every single one ever, even the random one-off Japanese white one. I think he has one of those. Mm-hmm. So I'm super excited about that. Oh, yeah. That sounds like fun. Yeah, that, that, I, uh, when you got that amp, that really piqued my interest. I have not, I've never owned an Ampeg, but I can imagine it's kind of like maybe like a cleaner version of a Super Reverb or something like that. Yeah, it's supposed to be, uh, pretty similar to the Super Reverb from yeah. my understanding. Yeah. Um, but probably more low end because, mm. Um, that's what Ampeg liked to do in the, in the seventies. That's kind of like my whole thing is vintage amps. Mm-hmm. That's actually my uh, newest amp that I have at a 74. So, <laughs> huh? Well, you're talking hey, my kind of... language then because I am a huge vintage amp fiend. Also... What kind of, what kind of Ampeg is that, Albert? Um, it's a VT40. It's a VT40. I always wanted a jet. Oh, like the, the Jets are jet. so cool. So yeah, I, that cool. was always kind of like my, my dream Ampeg if I could ever buy one was the Jet. I always thought that was super cool. Yeah, funny enough, I'm a bass player first. Not a huge fan of Ampeg's bass stuff. Hmm. Um, it, I, I'm okay with their cabs, like the older ones, or, you know, if I'm ever in a situation where there's like a house 810, I know that I can make that sound pretty good. But as far as their heads go, I mean, I probably wouldn't touch any Ampeg heads that are uh newer than like 85 so really? so yeah so oh, yeah. what's what's your sound. favorite there then like your favorite bass amp um so i use uh i kind of have a split between two that i use a lot um i'm a huge aguilar fanboy so i have a tone hammer oh, okay. 500 yeah and uh that i mean those are such such incredible amps um i love that uh the di on it sounds great because it mm. was designed as a di first funny hmm. um, cool yeah, it was one of those things where people liked it so much as the DI, they kept asking Ampeg to put one of those super light uh, power amps in it. And then, or uh, Aguilar, I think I said Ampeg there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they, they kept asking uh, Aguilar to do that. And after a couple of years, they finally listened. And uh, from my understanding, it's pretty much their hottest seller. So uh, good on them for listening to what the people want. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, And then uh, my other amp I use all the time is uh, one of my other old amps. It's a Sun Spectrum 1. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's 60 watts somehow off a of 2 EL34. Super loud, <laughs> super clean. Mm-hmm. Um, just an awesome, awesome amp. I throw that on like an old uh, 115 and it it, uh, it shakes some walls. So <laughs> That's that's rad. And, and 60 that's watts really interesting. Of, of tube watt, I mean tube watch you wouldn't think there's a lot in the bass realm but um i know i like i've played bass through like the basements like the yeah. old ones and okay. and i mean they uh i guess it's all about the cab you have if you can push oh, yeah. push it 
Um, I think it's about what you want, too, because I think a lot of people, when they think bass, I know what I'm looking for if I actually want to get a bass tone and I'm playing bass, is I'm looking for that kind of clean thump, you know? And you need a lot of wa- not a lot of clean watts to get that, I think, you know? Mm-hmm. If you're looking for the, a lot of character in the bass or those older muffy tones, I think that anything will work, you know? Yeah. I think that 60, 100 watts is plenty if you if the band will will compensate and maybe not just crank up maybe the guitar player doesn't crank the bass up on their amp mm-hmm. for a change you know or they don't uh they don't scoop too much i think you're all right with lower wattages yeah Oops. for sure for sure if i'm trying to go for that thumpy thing then uh i grab the tone hammer probably 10 times out of 10 on that yeah um, but if i want something that's you know kind of like what you're saying a little more character a little bit more grit uh takes uh any kind of like distortion and stuff super well um then i usually uh i'll usually grab the sun so <laughs> it's, it's a pretty even split for me which which one i go for it just kind of depends on what i'm doing and i'm a little bit uh too much of a tweaker with my bass tone sometimes so mm-hmm. yeah yeah um that that leads me to i'm gonna pick up on something later in the discussion about uh, something i saw at nail um that, that piqued my interest about bass amps. But, uh, so, so, uh, what do you do with Sonosoid? Yeah. Um, so right now I do, uh, marketing, advertising, um, run socials mostly. Um, Anthony helps out a lot with, uh, he'll, he'll throw a couple of, a couple of posts in there if I'm slacking a little bit. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, a lot of stuff in that realm. Um, I try to, dabble in other realms when i can you know mm-hmm. just the whole small company everybody wears a lot of hats um but my uh my main job kind of resides more in the marketing advertising social kind of realm yeah yeah so you don't answer any of the ims uh no i have never <laughs> answered an im for sign <laughs> well apparently apparently um that's a big no-no with uh anthony but uh, I didn't know that till till yesterday. Uh, he kind of called me out a little bit about it, um, about Another using that. Another podcast too. I know, I know. I'm I'm, I'm starting a feud. <laughs> 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 Not really, but uh, but yeah, Anthony, I'll try to tone it down. I'll email you from now on. So. Um, well, I got another question for you, uh, Albert. Or is it okay to call you Albie? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. what my Nam badge said. Awesome. Um, how do you keep your mustache so neat? <laughs> so I, I think the real key here is the fact that it doesn't really grow. <laughs> so, so it's about uh, once every two weeks, you know, I kind of trim the sides in a little yeah, bit. Yeah. And then I look for hairs that are uh, kind of poking way out. But all in all, pretty low maintenance. <laughs> oh. You guys would never guess uh, how long this mustache has been going. That's awesome. I, I've never been able to rock a stash by itself. It, it's like a special person who can pull that off, and, and you definitely can. Uh, <laughs> and you're a big Dolphins <laughs> fan, right? Oh, yeah. I uh, I would consider myself the biggest Dolphins fan in the Midwest, at least. <laughs> so. so why the Dolphins? Uh, it's It's kind of like a family thing. So I, I'm originally from Florida, um, greatest place in the world, if you ask me. Um, and my dad grew up like, I want to say 30 minutes outside of Miami. Um, so, I mean, in 66, when the Dolphins formed, my grandpa became a huge fan um, about, uh, oh gosh, it would have been, so 72 was when they won their first Super Bowl. Um, and that was when my dad was nine. So he was like, oh, this is tight. Football's cool. My team wins, you know? <laughs> so uh, he, he became a big Dolphins fan. I mean, it's even to the point where, like, when my parents met, my dad was in a Dolphin starter jacket and aqua parachute pants. So <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very much a family thing. So uh, no, I don't think anybody would choose this life if they <laughs> could choose. <laughs> Yeah, we don't choose life as Lions fans either in Ooh, Michigan. Oh, it just yeah. just happens. Rip, rip. I know it's <laughs> it's terrible. It's terrible. But the reason why I ask is because like I have, like we have a lot of um like in Michigan Packers fans, 
mm. just mm-hmm. because you know you're you're close to Wisconsin. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. it's a team a lot, that wins. <laughs> yeah, and they're a team that wins, and I think it's the latter more than the former in that regard. But usually, you you always hear, you know, people say, "Well, you know, it started when I was a kid, and and my dad was a was a, a Green Bay fan, and now I'm a Green Bay fan," and and I can see that too. But usually, uh, displaced fans are the worst. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh yeah. I uh, I would definitely have to agree with that. I for some reason growing up in Florida, I would run into Patriots fans all the time, and you know I'd always ask them. I'd be like, "Oh, so you know how long did you live in Boston?" I'd be like, "Oh, I've I've never been there." <laughs> I'm like, "Oh, you know, is any of your family from there?" They're like, "No." Oh, that's like, that's oh. the worst. Yeah. <laughs> so you like good teams, is what you're telling me right now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's like being from down here. Like, you know, everybody should be a Saints fan, but yeah. like you get those Dallas Cowboy fans, and it just makes you go, "Ugh!" Like, oh. really? Like, they're they're the worst. Well, I don't know if it's it's between them and the Patriots for worst displaced fan. <laughs> that 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 is is the absolute worst. Yeah. I dude, I would be if I lived down there. I would be the most diehard New Orleans fan ever. Yeah. Like, oh, oh, and they were terrible for years and years and years. I mean, oh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm not a bandwagon fan. Like, uh, when they, what was it? Was it 2008 that they won the, they played in the Super Bowl? I don't remember. It was, it was, was about 10 years ago. Nine. Yeah. And, and, and it was like my whole life up to that point. Like, they were terrible. And then, like, this year they had a pretty good, decent team. Um, but, it's just I don't know. It's if you're if you're from here, it's it's just a culture thing. Yeah. Well, it, they lost stupidly. They had a great team this year, and they're going to have a fantastic team next year. Yeah. Um, it's uh, you know, but that's I guess this this is the football podcast now. That's what we're. I know. I know oh, we have, the no, second yeah, you throw okay. me on there, uh, it's always going to go back to football somehow. <laughs> yeah. But I'm tell, I'm telling you, LB, we need a Ray Finkel sinusoid shirt. <laughs> I uh, I think we might have to make that next in line. Uh, the the Lasoid ones have been doing pretty well, so maybe the next run will be a uh, be Ray Finkel, and we can put the whole laces out thing on it, and it it'll just be good. I posted a good saying with it too, and it made sense at the time, and I can't remember what I said. It's driving me crazy. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, you know, a, a funny, a funny thing too, LB. I actually, uh, I have what some people would would call Facebook dyslexia. When I'm when I'm like reading, when I'm going down the Facebook feeds, like I see things like the way I want to see them apparently. And I thought your last name was Lanyard Miles. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> That uh, that's almost as good as when uh, Steve mispronounced my middle name uh, when I joined the inner circle. <laughs> he, uh, he he made my name sound way fancier than it already is, so I kind of got to give him props for that because that's not easy. Um, but he instead of Lanier, he did Lanier, and I was like, ooh, I I might have to start running with that because yeah. uh, it's pretty good. You could pretty probably get close to that around here. Like everybody would think it was like a French name or something. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it is French in origin, from yeah. what I understand. So maybe that's the actual pronunciation of it. And then my family just did the whole thing where we Americanized it. But so we found the secret of his mustache. Then yeah, it's the French origin. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually only slightly French. I'm super Italian. Just the mustache. Just the mustache. <laughs> oh, okay. You got two. You got two aspects of mustache cred. You got the, oh, yeah. the French mustache and the Italian mustache mixed together. You're like mustache think, heaven. <laughs> but I think the reason why it doesn't grow is because I've got like a decent chunk of Native American in me too. So, uh, uh, and and I know that you know they they don't grow a ton of body hair generally um, speaking. So yeah. your body's at war with itself. <laughs> pretty, pretty much. It's uh it's made for some fun results up to this point. So you know I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> okay. okay we're, we're like, okay, we'll let the mustache go, but nothing else. <laughs> yeah, seriously, my chest bears it gets. Anybody who's seen me uh, at a trade show knows that as the buttons progressively go down. Well, I just, I just, I knew that you embody the the Florida like mindset completely, because like you walk in there with the with the the Hawaiian print shirt. 
and it's unbuttoned all the way down to your belly button, and like <laughs> it looks like you're fixing to go to a beach, you know, which is oh, yeah. is, is way cool. Um, now you're from you you were telling me you were from Panama City, right? We're going geography oh, yeah. podcast here for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'm I'm from uh, the Panhandle area. Yeah. My dad, um, after a little bit of moving around, um, settled up there because um, he's he's originally more from South Florida. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I spent my whole life growing up in uh, the biggest spring break town in yep. the country. So uh, <laughs> that was a lot of fun. I've seen some things. Redneck Riviera. Oh yeah. Yeah. Panama City is just like a fun combination of, well, I, I don't know if it's a fun combination, but uh, it's a combination of like one third, you know, those classic Florida man stories, mm-hmm. probably one third, the whole super rednecky thing, and then about a third spring break leftovers. Yeah. So it, uh, I mean, it, it made it a really interesting place to grow up. And, you know, I'm, uh, I'm really thankful that I got to spend as much time as I did down there. And I think it gave me a a really interesting perspective on the world in a couple of ways so mm-hmm. yeah yeah well i love the that's kind of like my idea of going to a good beach around here anyways um oh uh, yeah you know we're only like a three-hour ride over to pensacola and so um you know if you want to go to a good beach go there now if you want to go to the terrible beach you go to the mississippi beach <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about right yeah <laughs> so well, cool. Well, let's uh, let's dive back into some Naom. Um, <laughs> I I, I want to just give you. A, I'm just going to give our listeners a quick overview of my experience there, and then we'll we'll uh, let you know kind of pick your brain a little bit, Albert. What it is from the, your perspective being in the industry, and then um, I want to get get Josh and Nick's um, kind of overview from what they saw from the coverage, what appealed to them, and kind of their thoughts on it. But um, I'll just give a quick rundown, like my experience. Got out there. Um, me and my wife went, uh, flew in from New Orleans, direct flight to LAX. I did not know that you're not supposed to go to LAX to go to NAM. Um Everybody <laughs> was telling me, no, 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 don't do that. So I was not prepared for, um, you know, the crazy amount of traffic. I was going to have to go through to get there, but, uh, it wasn't bad. Um, I'm actually glad I flew into LAX because it was hard to find flights to, um, John Wayne from, you know, from New Orleans. Cause there was a, there was a couple that was going to NAM that was sitting behind me on the plane and they were complaining because they, they didn't know that they thought that they were going to go to Phoenix and then get on another flight and go to John Wayne. And what happened was, my flight was going to LAX and then it was going to Phoenix and then it was going to John Wayne. And Ooh, so that's terrible. Oh yeah. They spent forever in the air. Like I, I probably beat them by several hours getting there. So, um, but it, so it wasn't bad. I kind of got baptized by fire that way, uh, going into LA and, um, got there, spent, uh, did a day at Disneyland with my wife and then, Next morning, got up and went to Disneyland again because Nam kind of starts late. And, you know, here I am on Central Time and everything is like, uh, you know, it's two hours behind. And so I'm getting up at 530 in the morning. Nothing's going on. Um, So, yeah, hit Disneyland that morning, then went to Nam, uh, came back and hit Disneyland again. Um, Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was crazy. (laughs) Yeah, I walked. I, 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 I tracked my walking. I did 12 miles that first day (laughs) it was rough um but i had a blast i got out on the floor tried to hit it hard um you know i was having guys like uh michael newman and uh, i think jamie davis had texted me some and or said some stuff in the groups about hey check this out um i know josh and nick you were sending me uh things that you would like to find out about and so that's kind of the angle i attacked it is just trying to, um, I knew I couldn't do it all. So that kind of gave me a plan. Like, okay, I'm going to go check out the, the frame moose. I think that's how you say it booth, check out those guitars. And, and then I ran into new X, uh, which is like, that's something you're interested in, Josh. Yeah. And, uh, uh, had a friend, I ran into a friend, a local friend out there. He was with PV. And so he's a, amazing guitar player 
and I was able to, I just said, Hey, is it cool if I go around and follow you and just capture what you're doing? He's like, sure, man. And so, you know, uh, we spent some time at the new X booth and then we went to, um, the PV booth and he did a live performance there. And, uh, we went to the guild booth and, uh, caught, caught some footage there. Um, just had a blast doing that. Uh, and then, uh, I think I went to the second day I ran it. I started running into the guys, uh, who are, who I knew through the hum and the slum and, you know, all my internet friends I was running into and I was kind of following them around and it went to the, the DRS booth where Cower, uh, he makes those and he had several, his guitars out there. Uh, Kevin Equitz had, uh, I think three of his uh, two guitars and a bass there, and I, I want to add his bass is amazing. The Devera bass, uh, it is it is just it's a work of art. If I was in the market for a bass, that would totally be you know something that was on my radar. Um, got to check out the new Titan KR2, and that's kind of interesting. Like um, it it's got like a Fender. Um, Jazzmaster Jaguar type uh, bridge on it, and I, I wasn't crazy about that. But so, but he's talking about like doing something that's going to mod it to make it better, and so I kind of want to see what he goes there with. But it was a really rad guitar. It had like a reverse headstock on it. It had like a kind of a neonish uh, green pickguard and like a, a blue almost purple finish on it. Um, he had a pink one there. It was like pink and black. That was really cool. Uh, trying to think what else I hit. Re uh, Revel. What's the name of the band? Uh, Revelator? Revel. That... Something like that. No, it's not Revelation, is it? It's not Revelation. Because that's that uh, That's that uh, interesting. I know which one that one is. Yeah. You're talking about the one with the, with the like... Um, Nerf body insert type thing, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. The name of it, Revelator. Oh, yeah, it I think it's Revelator. Yeah, I think yeah. it is too. Yeah, I, I went by that booth. That was kind of interesting. Like they just had like a chopped block with a neck on it with pickups in it, and then like you pick your body style that you just want to pop on. It's like a pop on, pop off panel, and uh, it's it was it was an interesting guitar. Um. Hmm. I got I ran by the Harmony booth. They have a new line that looks really rad. It it nods to kind of the department store old sixties guitars. And mm -hmm. I didn't get to talk to a rep there, but uh it was it was um it's interesting to see what they're priced at. I, I'm definitely gonna be looking for those. Yeah, I was kind of expecting them to be at the super level, like mm -hmm. up there, but then I saw their amps. And I mean, those look like really high quality amps. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't, I don't think you're going to be able to touch. Um, I, I would imagine that the smaller combo one, that's the reproduction of the 14, whatever. I can't remember what it was, 34 or 84. Um, that one really interests me, but I bet you that one's around the Blues Junior level range, and the yeah. other one's probably, you know, like it's that looks like a $600 head, mm -hmm. but. You know, I don't know. But the head, they look super cool. Though. I'm really interested in those. Um, I like the new guitars. The guitars look really great, too. Um, I wish the website had more about them. It was basically like they threw up a landing page, and that stuff's coming, but they don't have any, like, dealers or anything or any prices or any information like that up yet. Because um, yeah. I was I was really surprised that they were they were there and they had new stuff. Um Somebody yeah. must have obviously bought the just bought the brand name, right? And is using it similar to probably. I would imagine Tysco. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, probably. So I, I didn't even know Tysco. Did somebody buy Tysco? A name at least, probably. They got they got pedals out that look interesting. Yeah, I know oh, really? somebody did that with uh, Supro. So I think Pigtronics yeah. owns Supro. Wait, wait yeah. did somebody that, just that buy Supro? Yeah. Uh, I don't no. think they just did, but a uh, a little while ago. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm like 99% sure that Pictronics owns Supro. Not, not 100%. Because so we talked about that a few episodes ago. 
yeah. um, wondering what's happening with them because they're discounting stuff like mad, like super, super heavy, all of their stuff right now. Yeah. Well, that makes sense because at NAMM, they, their booths were like right there by each other. And I know like Sam Ash, like a lot of times if there's a cell on Supro, there's a cell on Pictronics at the same time. So that would totally make sense. Back the case. <laughs> That's what we do on this podcast. We solve gear. We solve gear mysteries. Yeah. Uh, so 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 Nick's the Scooby Doo of this, right? Yeah. <laughs> I guess I'm Shaggy. I don't know. Um, <laughs> that makes me Velma. Oh, no, wait a minute. I'm the pretty woman. I'm Daphne. I'm Daphne. <laughs> I don't know. Fred's shirt wasn't open enough. I can't be Fred. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a you need, but you do need a scarf. I feel like you need a scarf. Yeah, well, that French influence. That French influence. Yeah, for sure. Oh, there you go. Um, I just, you know, what really surprised me, guys, is like people saying they didn't have enough time to see everything. Like, how big is this place, and how many vendors oh, are there? Good question. Uh, no idea. It was like what four stories. Something like that, and then Four they had, stories? and then they had two other like buildings that had wings that had stuff on it. So that's, I guess, those were like half floors. So maybe like, uh, if you put it all together, maybe five floors. Man, that seems crazy. Yeah, yeah. I made it to the basement. Is where I started, and and that was kind of chill down there. Um, Matthew's also very effects. confusing down there. Yes, it is because like. You got guys like Matthews down there, and then and then it like drifts into like the international companies, like the Chinese companies had a huge presence down there, and then um, then you go up to the next floor, and there's a lot of activity. Like you got all your main big, I, I bet I bet like that next floor is like the highest rent ones. It's got to be. Um, it had like all the big brands that are in stores, uh, like the big box stores. And then towards the back, you started getting into like some of the boutique pedal companies. And then that was pretty much it. I went up one day, I went up to the PV and Guild area, like on the next floor up. Um, and that was that was the extent of where I went in now. Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't make it all over the place. Um, it, it was just... But you, 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 you got the most important one that I was interested in. And, and that the, was... Re, the, re, the Recording King. Yes. Yeah. That that definitely okay. So Recording King, like I've been following them for a while. I had one way back. Um, they've got the uh, a triple O copy that's all solid woods. Like it's got the spruce top and the mahogany back and sides, and it's priced right. At, it, it's saying the street value is going to be about like three hundred or three fifty, which oh yeah, which is like you can't even get like a martin that's in the 500 hundred dollar dollar range with those same solid woods oh no no mm-hmm. well it's you're clo- you, yeah you got to go a couple hundred dollars up and go to the dreadnought junior right yeah and and still like this is that that triple o uh shape so it's still even different so i mean yeah for sure it's that i know it's you know it, it's made overseas it's not american made but i I would definitely be interested in snatching one of those up. Yeah, for sure. That sounds cool. Sounds super cool. Well, I played the uh, I played a Dirty Thirty a couple of times at Guitar Center, and mm-hmm. I love that guitar. They're really well made. Um, just the features on them. Like if there was ever a kid that was asking to get an acoustic or a parent or something, I'd send them that way for sure. And yeah. I, I will probably end up with. I, I might even end up with that Martin Triple O because. I, mm. I like that guitar, like the triple O and, um, that's really, it's almost super, too, super affordable to pass up. And I, when they start showing up used, I'll probably start looking at one. Oh yeah. Um, those will probably be crazy. To no. Use. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I just wonder, I just wonder if they're making those inexpensive musicians friend one that we talked about a while back, the ones with the slot heads and all those, other, cause it seems like those are awfully similar to the recording King ones. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it, it'd be interesting if we see one of those as a stupid deal of the day and you're like, yeah, that looks exactly like it, but with uh, with uh, different inlays or something. You yeah. Know, be something to watch for. Because they've done that before. There's, you know, because Rogue started out as, uh, what, Squire. Rogue by Squire. So, hmm. yeah. Be interesting. I did not know that, actually, huh? Yeah. 
Yeah, if you look back at the early ones, they say Rogue by Squire. And it's because they were using the same factories as Squire was using in uh, Korea. And, and, uh, That's interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Yep. Well, so Albert, what did you see that you liked? If like, let's let's get specific. Let's like, like Clifton. I know you were talking about Fuzzrocious and that whatever that octave thing you were playing through sounded just wicked. Yes, uh, that was awesome. Um, what about you, Albert? What did you see? Did you get to play through any? You said you didn't really pick up any guitars, so this question's probably like worthless. Yeah. <laughs> there were definitely a lot of things that I that I saw that I liked um, that I probably would have liked to have gotten a little bit more time to play but i mean it's just such a different perspective being at nam like on the industry side um kind of like what you referenced a minute ago i mean i think i picked up one guitar and it was uh that weird jag strat at the fender booth <laughs> mm. <laughs> and honestly other than that you know i i didn't really play anything i wasn't really checking out a whole lot of stuff um it's I, I was kept pretty busy with a lot of the things that we were doing. And also that this was my fifth NAM, I wanna say. Mm. So at that point it kinda starts to uh maybe lose a little bit of its luster, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, like it, it's always cool getting to see friends and people um people that I've met and all that. But I mean it's it's kinda one of those things where it's like, eh, I mean it's so loud in there I can't really hear it anyway. I'll just wait for a reverb demo of it. Mm -hmm. for the most part yeah um but i did really like um so the new chase bliss uh the is it the condor the filter okay uh, that uh that pedal super super intriguing to me and then um also at his booth i'm a giant like giant ryan adams fan oh, so yeah. the sorcerer um his signature benson um i mean that amp just from what i could hear of it sounded incredible um, I mean, if there were two guys that I wanted to trust, you know, building an, a custom amp for me and, you know, doing all the all the trim and stuff in it, it'd be Joel and Chris. Like, I mean, awesome. you, you can't really get better than that, in, uh, in my opinion, in a, in a lot of ways. So um, so that was really cool. That was kind of a kind of a big highlight for me. Yeah, cool. Well, I know oh, every time and... I went by you guys, like you were you were with uh, Anthony a lot, and you guys yeah. seemed like up to your ears, like and and just busy at now. Like y'all, um, it was it was like I know you guys were having to run the business from now, kind of. Yeah, um, it's it's always an interesting struggle um, doing that. Uh, you know, having to go back to the house after a long day full of meetings and everything and then you know answer a bunch of customer service emails um or deal with clifton on the chat <laughs> <laughs> um, you know just just normal day-to-day -day stuff for anthony <laughs> um, but uh but yeah i mean so th so there's a little bit of a struggle with it you know um like amidst uh all the meetings and everything since i do a lot of our social um that was kind of like a big concern for me but i mean on that end, it's not super difficult just because Nam is a wealth of content, uh -huh. and I'm super thankful for all of our friends that were at the show that were using our cables that made it a whole lot easier for me yeah. <laughs> on that front. So, um, so yeah, it's it's always interesting, but I mean, it's you know, Nam never really fails to be a good time at this point. Um, what kind of matters more to me, and what I think I get more out of it is the people aspect. Yeah, I I, I couldn't agree more. Um... I think that for me, the whole reason in even in going to Nam, you know, the two times I've been, has been to see the people that I've been interacting with, like in these groups, and and uh, you know, it, when you're a podcaster, there's all the other podcasters that you want to uh, meet, and then all the you know the people that that you um, that you deal with, uh, you know, and so it's 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 a re it's a great place to run into everybody at one time you know and yeah. and uh if you if you focus on just the gear it's it's way too overwhelming because there's just so much i felt like i just hit the tip of the iceberg you know and and really that's that's the way I, why i did the way i did it was just i wanted to capture what uh our listeners wanted to know about first you know for anything else like i just wanted to hit all the high spots there i could because i knew there was no way that I could hit it all. Mm -hmm. 
Well, we we let's both both. This is for Albert and Clifton. Weirdest person you saw. <laughs> um, this this year was pretty tame actually in terms of that i feel like compared to the past couple um i might uh i might be stealing um this answer but i think for me it was there was a chick who had a big mohawk mm. um and she if uh i think ryan uh posted a picture of her and his like people of nam thing mm-hmm. that he always does mm-hmm. And to me, just the way that her her hair was done, because it's not just a straight up vertical mohawk. There's like stuff coming off on the sides too. Is She's it the peacock very, one? Uh, yeah, I kind of thought more beta fish than peacock. <laughs> but, um, I'll I'll probably I'll probably go with her. I was picturing like a the shredder's helmet kind of vibe. Oh god. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know for but, me, but, like um, uh, my wife had. She didn't make it down to the floor with me. Uh, she's got this crazy thing, like where her feet blister, like really quick. And so after Disneyland, like she was done. So, um, but so I had a pass for her, but she didn't end up coming. And she was kind of disappointed when I was showing her like the people and them thing, because she was like, "Oh my goodness, this would have been so much fun just to people watch." Um, she had this idea that like everybody there would be like this hipster, like uh, you know that like it was just full of hipsters and i'm like no 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 like you've got all these carryovers from like the 80s who are still living like it's 1984 i mean it it and that i think the most outrageous thing i saw was there was a dude i saw him about twice that was wearing like this purple trench coat like it was uh velvet and he had this black top hat on and he looked like dr facilier out of um the princess and the frog, like the voodoo doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just, it was, but that was probably even mild compared to some things. I mean, it was just the, you could see some of the most absurd things. And then like, it was like, it was just a smattering of every walk of life in the music community that you could imagine was there. So, well, there was one. There was one person I didn't see that w- that is usually there that uh, I didn't see any pictures of. Do you know? Do you know who the individual yeah, you, who got to go to Nashville to see him? No, oh, <laughs> no TL, no TLB. Do you know who we're talking about, Albert? Uh, I think so. I I feel like I have a pretty good idea. <laughs> <laughs> the guy with the uh the cow print trench coat mm-hmm. and the cowboy hat. Uh, very loved by Diaz, from yes. what I understand. <laughs> Matter of fact, Diaz wanted to, wanted you to tell us. He just oh, he just kind of how much you love him. Um, I love him. I'll say he's he's probably like a like a top five for me. And considering the Dolphins probably hold all three of the top three spots, I I think that really. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Diaz wanted to know how much he loved Diaz or how much he loved TLB. <laughs> <laughs> no, he wanted to, he wanted Albie to tell him how much he loved him. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, it's a lot, Diaz. I love you a lot. Yeah, yeah, they definitely have a bromance going on. Um. <laughs> <laughs> we got a couple of those. Couple. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, you know, there's a, so much more about the gear I want to talk about, and let me just real quick. A couple things I wanted to hit. Uh, Fuzz Rocious, you mentioned that earlier. I got to go by their um, by their booth and got to throw up my iPhone and a mic on their amp and got to capture a little clip. And they've got this new thing called the Octave John, J-A-W-N. It is not a pedal, even though it was in pedal form there. What they're doing is that's a drop-in to any of their Fuzz Rocious pedals that you can an upcharge. I think it's like 150 bucks. And you can have this octave uh, thing built in to any of their fuzz pedals, which I think is amazing. And it sounded great. Oh, that thing sounded incredible, man. Yeah. Yeah. I had no idea it was a drop-in like that. That makes it way cooler for me. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so it... It's actually, no, it's $100 for the drop-in. And then if you want to drop in on, like, if you already own an existing Fuzz Rocious product, it's $125. So it's actually just a, it's a small upcharge 
to really get like a two in one pedal thing. So I think that's so they're cool. not they're not going to put it in just pedal form like the tentacle or something. No, it's this is this is strictly an add on. Bummer. Yeah, I that's would like to have that though, by itself, actually, you know, but that's that's a pretty good value if you want, if you um, were going to pick up a fuzz rose just anyway. Well, I was like Clifton, buy it, buy it. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, it's, it sounded so good, man. Yeah. Like I and I, and I kept I was thinking of Josh too, because Josh was saying how he wanted a little more like creamier, distorted tone for church playing, mm -hmm. and I was like that thing that just nailed it. Mm -hmm. like, huh. You know, I mean, I guess it sounds a little organish, and maybe that's why I thought it was kind of cool. But yeah, I guess you could sound a little too and it got a Vita up there too, so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a but, it says a digital octaver, so it's fully. Oh man, it sounds it, um, sounds it rad. Now, now you got um, so cool. you got like shared by by the dude from Fresh Roches right there, right? I remember seeing your your name shared. Yeah, right there. yeah. I, I, I threw that video up, and then he um he asked to share it, and uh, that was cool. I had met Ryan um at uh, Summer Now, but I really did not expect him to um kind of remember me and i went up to the thing and he was like hey clifton what's up and i was like i was surprised like oh my gosh this dude at least he's acting like he remembers me <laughs> <laughs> he's a super cool he's a super cool down to earth yeah. guy oh, he, yeah. he remembers me. yeah and the guy that works with him oh, was super rad too and uh just really cool guys and then i, I got to step over to uh captured blake playing some yellow cake as well um uh, Ryan McKay, he's from just over in Alabama from where I'm at. And I uh, had him on the show several months back. And he's got some good stuff as well. He's got the Lyra, I think is the name of it. It's like a filter uh, effect. And you can kind of hear that in that demo um, that Blake was playing, uh, what it does. And it, it's really cool. The Lita Machine, I believe, is what it's called. Hmm. And let's see, Matthew's Effects had a really cool booth. They had these killer Josh Williams guitars there. And uh, I could tell when something's good, Kevin Equick's kind of fanboys over it, and he was totally fanboying over those guitars. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so if, if Kevin is impressed, you, you should pay attention to it. Well, who was shooting that video, Clifton, where he was playing? Was that you? Because I thought you were behind him. Yeah, I had that. I had my GoPro up on a tripod, and I was shooting that, and then I was behind him with a microphone in my hand, capturing the amp. So yeah, because it, it was all trippy. Because I was like, "Wait, why is Clifton over there behind him? Yeah. <laughs> like, who's filming? who's filming?" <laughs> yeah, that was my first attempt at Nam at Nam to capture any kind of content, and I was, you know, had <laughs> microphone in this hand, cables hanging this way. It was it was crazy, but uh, mm. so. Yeah, that's. I guess I'll move on from there. But I had a lot of fun doing those, and um, I still got more. I'm, I'm probably gonna try to uh, throw up. If you uh, if you don't already, I'm trying. I've thrown up. I think three of those up on Instagram, if, and I condensed them down to under a minute. And uh, go check them out, um, or I've, I've got them on the page too. So, uh, I want to say though that. Besides all that gear, I mean, I love talking about gear, but it was really the people again and getting to uh, to hang out and, and meet. I uh, met several people for the first time, like um, Jim Bowers, amazing guy. He kind of helped me, walk me through the process of what I needed to expect uh, getting to L.A. And, and he was, he's kind of, uh, he's from the area, he knows it well. He's um, he's the kind of go-to guy for that. We got to meet I love him. That guy, man. I got yeah. He's that great. guy cracks me up. He's super yeah, guy. He's, he's awesome. Brothers in orange. Oh, he's another orange guy. Well, oh, you, yeah. I'm going to bring up the orange thing here in a minute with you because uh, this is leading into the pizza party. Oh, yeah. Um, at, so we went to the pizza party uh, Friday and walked down the street. Um, it's probably like half a mile down the road from from Nam. And um, I got finally got to meet Spencer uh, Hyam. And his dad, uh, Eric, was with him. I, I think I got that right. And uh, great, super people. Uh, it was great to meet him. 
He's been uh, Spencer was on the show, and it was kind of funny. I got to talk to his dad. His dad was a little reluctant to let Spencer be on the, my show when we approached him, but uh, he listened to it and gave him the go ahead and everything. But uh, really, really cool people. Um, let's see who else. I got to to see the oh Jay Leonard J while we were walking yeah. there. That was super cool. <laughs> that that's cool. And and I had not met him um, up to that point, and he was so down to earth. He is every like his personality off screen is exactly like he is on his videos. Like he's just he's um just full of uh, energy and just a uh, really nice guy. Yeah, super nice. Yeah, he's awesome. I I like him a lot. Yeah. And and he's such a killer uh, guitar player. Matter of fact, uh, in his Keeley video I saw come out a few days ago, he's playing one of Kevin's, uh, I think the Rayburn, in that video. And I, I really hope that gives you know Kevin a good bump, because Kevin, let me, if I haven't said it before, Kevin is such a super guy. He's got a great product, and um, yeah, just just super chill. Was um, that the one that was uh, that was that the one I shared with you that was nom nom miked nom or unmiked, and it like uh, <laughs> it like bounced back and forth between the two, and you could like not hear them at all. And when it switched to mics, it was like awesome. Yeah, yeah, oh, that was that was hilarious. I had no idea how loud it actually was in there until I saw that video, and I was like, how do you even get anything accomplished in that place? Oh yeah, it it's like Guitar Center times three in there. It's a good way to describe it, I think. Yeah. Um. So yeah, we had pizza at the at the uh, pizza party. Bl uh, Blake with the Tone Mob put that on, and and all the Sinusoid boys were there. I finally got to meet Kevin. Um, with you yeah, guys, Kevin. He's a super great guy. Uh, super chill. I, yeah, and I, I so he doesn't mind uh, talking to me on the instant chat when I need something. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be like, "Hey, is this Kevin or Anthony?" Yeah. <laughs> Anthony put Kevin on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, and then the I uh, got to see uh, a couple of the slum guys. Uh, Aaron didn't make it until later that night. Um, Jonathan Fellows was there. It, um, some of you guys may not know Jonathan. Uh, I met him at Cowerfest last summer. Uh, he uh, makes guitars at home, and he's he's actually. Um, He's building a new shop out behind his house, um, and he makes some of the most rad pretty guitars. I think he's got uh, at Cowerfest. He had this jazz master that was the absolute hands down most pretty, best playing jazz master I've ever played in my life. And he had this. Uh, this is what had my interest with you, Albert. He had this orange uh, guitar that after the pizza party we're all out there in the parking lot and he's got this his guitar pulled out in the back of his truck showing everybody and i threw up a live stream on it on the group um it just if you could imagine the most pretty figured maple piece that you could ever come up with he used that to build the neck and he put a pit guard that matches that neck on on the guitar it is so gorgeous, and it's got this awesome orange finish on it. I think I might have seen pictures of that um, actually earlier today, maybe. I don't know. I, I saw a picture of Jim um, in what seemed to be a parking lot looking at an orange guitar. Mm. That's right. You guys <laughs> so, left, so I think. Y'all left before it was over. I think. Yeah, I had to go back uh, to the house that we were staying and um, grab something for somebody's booth, get him a mm. get him an IEC cable. So. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll uh, tag you in it um, if yeah, I come across definitely. it. But he's he's super rad guy. I got to talk with him at length that day about him building guitars and um, just really nice guy. Um, he's from up around. I think he's just a little bit south of San Francisco somewhere, and he drives down to Nam, and he's a real, really nice guy. Um, let's see. I think I covered the pizza party pretty much. Um, oh, so my buddy Isaiah won the Tone Mob Fuzz at that oh, one. Oh, yeah. Cool. That's it was right. like the gold sparkle one with the purple. Looked sweet. I'm yeah. super stoked for him on that. 
Yeah, and it was nice to I, I got to meet him as well. Super nice guy. Oh yeah. And and you guys like you're you're in the same area, right? Yeah, he lives probably like ten minutes away from me, actually. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I I hang out with and play music with him um, semi frequently. Okay. So, super super great guy. Yeah, yeah. He he seemed really nice, and I got to talk to him. So okay, so this leads to the next part. In that we went to, uh, they, I, f- I got wind that this t- uh, taco party was happening, and that. They're being all kind of secretive about it, like, oh, here's an address, show up here. And I didn't pay too much attention to it. And I look at it, and it's, like, telling me I need to go all the way back into L.A. for Anaheim. And I, oh, and, yeah. and I had not, at that point, like, when we drove from the airport, it wasn't too bad of traffic. But, like, so we're getting in the car, and um, my wife is like, Oh my goodness, this traffic is terrible. How long is it telling us? And it was like two hours almost to <laughs> to drive in. And um, so, anyways, we we came on and I got there and it was like this thing was supposed to start at six. We didn't get there till eight o'clock at night. And like we got there and there was just a few people hanging out, getting coffee and stuff. And I was like, oh okay. Next thing you know, like this party takes off, like. People start pouring in from all over the place. It was like everybody who finally had left Nam was coming up, you know. All oh, yeah. And it it was so much fun. Um, that they, they so they had Mad Labs coffee there. Um, they were making coffee. Some of the best coffee I've had, by the way. Um, just it was so it was so strong, but not bitter or acidic. And yeah, that was uh, that came in pretty clutch for me because I was uh, I was pretty tired that day, and you know being able to go get a cup of coffee at eight p.m. <laughs> yeah. uh, helped out a lot. Yeah, you needed it because like that. I think that party lasted till about twelve that night before they shut it yeah, down. Yeah, oh yeah. And so you definitely <laughs> needed that coffee. And then they had this taco stand there. They had this huge block of meat on it. I don't know if it was pork or beef or what it was. And they were, it, he was taking a knife and it was like spinning around and he was cutting off shavings and throwing it on a grill with the tortillas. Some of the most legit tacos. By the time, I think we waited in line for a taco for about an hour. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. And it was amazing. And um, so by the time, like, you know, they started the tacos and then they had this band show up and I, I never heard, heard of them or anything. And uh, they're setting up and, one of the things that caught my interest was they had this steel guitar player. And I was like, this, that's neat, you know, like it's a little out of the ordinary. And he's playing through a Baseman 50 uh, Silverface head. And it just sounds gorgeous, the, the tone coming out of that thing. And then there's some dude over there with like a brown uh, deluxe, Fender Deluxe that he's playing through. And I was just like in heaven, like with the gear these guys had. Like some yeah, I think amps. there were what four guitarists yeah. that weren't the lap steel. <laughs> yeah, it was a lap was steel, insane. a drummer, a bass player, and like four guitars, and like they were just trading off solos, no vocals, completely instrumental. They're playing like they went from playing like old, like uh, beach style, like uh, surf music, to like kind of go in and maybe a little of that Bakersfield country sound. It was really, it was really cool, and so it was. Uh, Mason Stoops is is kind of was the guy who pulled that together, and and uh, he's a friend of Gabriel Tenorio, I believe, and and uh, and I didn't know that this is something that they do kind of on a, on a semi regular basis. They have what they called Gitaco jams, where. They, That's so amazing. Yeah. <laughs> they meet up and just whoever they can throw a band together with, they do. And then they have tacos and invite a whole bunch of people. And so really, really, really cool thing. And I read about it in uh, Fretboard. Fretboard Journal had an article about it. Uh, so It was go, a really cool article, yeah. too. Um, just the idea of, like, a bunch of good musicians in the area getting together and just jam. I mean, that's that's pretty awesome i i really like that 
Yeah, it was it, it, it was like I like the what he had to say is like you can't just sit there and wait on something good to happen. Sometimes it's best to like create your own event. Mm -hmm. And that's totally what he did, you know. Like I you heard about like Tom Petty yeah, uh, when he was in Mud Crutch, like he did the same thing down in Florida. Like he would just he did his own event and that's one of the things that made them successful early on was you know, we're not gonna sit around and wait on something to happen, we're gonna create our own event. Uh I I'm thinking like there's just so much that went on at that at that that I could just talk about for the next hour and a half, but I won't. Um one of the things I wanted to talk about with you, Albert, though, is did you notice the bass amp that guy had? Oh, yeah. It was an old uh, flip top. Yeah. And it sounded so good. So good. Oh, yeah. And it carried. I mean, it it, it was prominent. And I know that those aren't high wattage amps, but... Mm -hmm. I think the thing that really got me about um, how well it carried was... Cause you, uh, so, um, for people who weren't there the uh, area we were in it wasn't like an enclosed building mm -hmm. really. it was kind of out in the open and you know usually bass doesn't carry super well especially with a low wattage amp like that in that kind of a setting but i mean i i could hear him from all the way you know back toward where the tacos were just fine so <laughs> it was uh it was pretty impressive actually <laughs> yeah yeah i was i was definitely um impressed and so it was definitely, if, if you could imagine the best type of band that musicians would be into, it was kind of like a musician's musician band. Yeah, that's a, I think that's a really good way of describing it. I couldn't even imagine playing in front of that crowd. Like the, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't ever get nerves when I play really, but knowing that I would be in front of a crowd of just a ton of incredible musicians, that might get me feeling a little nervous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But it, it was it was such a good time, and that kind of capped off Nam for me. Uh, so let me tell you a quick story, um, and, and I'm probably going to embarrass the snot out of him if he listens to this, but I'm going to tell the story anyways. So I'm uh, so I'm I'm sitting there, and uh, I didn't bring a lot of cash with me, uh, and so everything was cash at this taco party, and uh, so they're doing the raffle, and like at that point, like. You know, I'd bought the taco plates and, and the, the parking and everything. And so, like, I didn't have any more cash on hand. And Kevin Equitz walks up to me. He's got a stack of these raffle tickets. And he's like, dude, you didn't get in the raffle? And I was like, no, nah, man, I, you know, I didn't. And he, he said, well, here you go. And he rips off, like, this whole stack of tickets. He's like, here, dude, take these. And I'm like, no, 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 dude, I don't want your tickets. You know, you need those. And he's like, no, 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 I'd be insulted if you don't. And... No, like I had, I had no idea <laughs> and I felt kind of bad about this, but like, so a bunch of, the, when they started calling out these names, like there's guys in the slum winning pedals. I think Aaron won like a, it was like a womb tone. Yeah, uh, yeah, it was the womb tone. Paul, lucky dude, won like three things out of that raffle. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I was like, man, Paul needs to like buy a lot Chill. of tickets all the time yeah because like <laughs> he's got the biggest amount of luck out of anybody we've ever seen so and then they get down towards the end and like they call my number and i mm. win this jhs uh twin 12 and i'm like oh, well i i'm gonna go talk to kevin and be like dude this is yours you know and like i go over to him and he refuses it and i'm just like man kevin is like the one of the best dudes like just top-notch dudes for him to do something like that he's just um he's an incredible guy and so yeah that's really cool. yeah that pedal is awesome too you that that pedal's perfect through your rig i i was so i'd never really considered a jhs pedal because you know that for what they are like you know, they're a lot of them are drive pedals and like, uh, you know, they're $200, and that's always kind of been like, well, I can always get something, you know, for under 100 But I played that, and I was so impressed. Like, and then I was having trouble capturing video for it, and I decided to test it, put it through its paces, and just go direct out of it into my phone. And my goodness, I was blown away how well that sounded. Like, 
it's everything when they say it's a preamp it is it stands up by itself like you could you could um use that at the end of your chain and go direct into a sound system if you had to like it, it's, yeah really, it's amazing i really want to try one now that sounds like it'd be right up my alley yeah yeah i just, actually thought got, of you because like it's got that trebly kind of overdrive oh yeah it on the light drive side it had that yeah it was a lot of high end really crisp and it but when it saturated it had a really good you know creamy lead tone but it didn't first but the high end stayed there yeah so i mean yeah. part of it's because you're playing your telly you know what amp were you playing that through originally well i was playing through my pro reverb and my live stream okay and then like when i did the video that i put out later like where it's focused in on the pedal where i'm turning the knobs and everything i literally went direct out into my i rig straight into my phone yeah mm -hmm. and um, i was so blown away by the way that sounded yeah i want to if i ever get the chance to check one out i'm going to that seems like it's going to be a really good drive that would be on my board yeah but yeah well josh uh thinking about nam was there anything that stood out to you well, really, uh, I, I just kind of thought that the direction, the overall direction that they're going with uh, guitars um, is really interesting. Like, if you look at the way the colors are going and, like, the Harmony guitars and the alternate universe uh, fenders and a lot of those other, other things, um, there's this really interesting aesthetic going on there. Um, moving from guitars as, like, you know... Uh, kind of art pieces to almost being there's this really utilitarian vibe to a lot of those new guitars coming out mm -hmm. where they look they look like um number one they they those fender alternate universe ones kind of look like they are going for a new sound with them rather than rather than okay this is a telly this is a strat yeah. you know and then the harmony guitars they all kind of look like they're tools rather than um, art pieces, mm -hmm. you know, they've got this nice utilitarian look to them where I think that it's showing, uh, I think in another podcast, I heard him talk about the guitar maturing into something that's a musical instrument rather than a statement of rebellion or, you know, that rock and roll ethos, which, mm -hmm. you know, the guitar isn't that the guitar is a musical instrument for making music. And that's what it, to me, uh, kind of struck me for Nam is that, Rather than being this, oh, man, look at this great figured stuff. Well, yeah, that's there, but that's not the point of the guitar. The point of the guitar is making music. Yeah. And if you, it feels like that that's the direction that the aesthetic is going. That and that, uh, not, no Atlantic, I really want to play that thing because that looks like a right up my alley, $150 for, for those two effects. Man, that's pretty good. And uh, I hear that you can do a swelling... Uh, shimmer with it if i holding down the button that sounds pretty cool mm -hmm. yeah that's that's what, what caught me they seem really cool and uh i think they're still kind of uh looking like i talked to their rep and they were mm -hmm. talking about how they're going to be uh trying to get into dealers here in the u.s in the near future so it, it it's going to be not just direct marketing like the website and so yeah i'd like to see that happen he was actually the rep for your uh, neck of the woods so um huh. hopefully they'll pop up in some of your local stores soon i, I definitely That'd told him cool. to go to the grand rapids area and um try to get in there yeah be cool to see him on gear actually gear tree and uh well what's and uh firehouse. Oh, yeah. what's that firehouse yeah firehouse. if they got into if they got into that then they could immediately you know cover basically <laughs> most of the u.s if they wanted to mm -hmm. and uh yeah, and I think that I saw their their um, retail price. It looks like it's like one fifty or something. Mm -hmm. And for all that, for one fifty, man, that's yeah. that's a heck of a pedal. And I like that, that it kind of looks like a Strymon pedal, but it doesn't at all do it. And it kind of does something similar, but they put their own spin on it, so it's not just a clone. Yeah. You know, they haven't did they didn't do all that they didn't do all this stuff exactly like that. I, and I mean. I think that uh, a lot of those Chinese companies have been accused of that in the past, but uh, I think that that's a really cool and interesting direction uh, that they're going in. Yeah. Uh, for that, yeah. Well, what about you, Nick? I think I think I pretty much covered it for Nam. Um, I <laughs> I saw some really. I mean, yeah. I mean, there was a lot to see there, obviously, and um, 
everything. The thing with me and them is like everything looks so expensive. So sure. I'm always thinking, ah, well, I'm probably not getting anything like that. And that's great and all, but yeah, until it actually like hits stores and stuff, you know, I, I don't really yeah. have any thoughts about it, you know, other than the recording King and the harmony and, um, some of the, some of the other stuff. Um, and I, I had a really good time on the, on Instagram watching the people of Nam thing. That was, <laughs> that was the best. I, cause I had never really thought of Nam that way either. I, I thought it was, you know, there'd just be a lot of musicians walking around, um, like it'd be in any magazine, but I didn't picture it like Vegas, you yeah. know, with <laughs> a lot of like just interesting people walking around. So yeah, I like to, um, I never really paid much attention before, but this year I did just because that, that kept showing up on my feed on Instagram and I was like, this is, this is hilarious. Yeah. So I'm glad, I'm glad they did that. That was, that was different and uh good on, good on Ryan for pulling that off. That was a kind of a cool thing to do. Yeah. He's, but, he's, he's gotten enough, like acclimated enough to Nam to have a really good pulse on what's going on there and what to capture. Yeah. He looked really natural. He looked really like. I mean, I, I don't want to say more professional, but he didn't look like he was rushing. He looked like he was yeah. just on the on the spot covering things like a yeah. like a reporter yeah. almost. I have to say, uh, like he he was the first person I ran into at now, and he is he's always so approachable. Like he was he was like he was he was on his way at his film crew with him. He's like, hey dude, uh, you know, he's talking in like South California way he talks, and he's like, hey dude, um, I'm going to get lunch. Uh, you want to come with us? And I'm like. Oh no, thanks, man. I'm just hitting the floor. But like, he's just so like down to earth, and like he um like does doesn't mind talking to any of his listeners. Or I mean, he's he's so approachable. And then I got to meet Steve at the uh, taco party, and Steve is amazing as well. Like just so down to earth. <laughs> that's cool that's cool i thought you were gonna go the other way there and then steve turned into an octopus or something yeah. <laughs> it turns out steve the worst <laughs> nah, i love you steve. oh man You're not the worst. So, uh, before we move on too much uh tim belint asked a question on the website okay. or on the on the page and he says alvy um how do you feel about slap bass oh gosh <laughs> So me, me and him had a, had a little bit of a conversation um, at NAMM, and it's not specifically slap bass that I don't like. I just don't like the super mid-scoop kind of bass oh. tone that's, like, super clanky and just kind of gross, honestly. Yeah. Um, me and him had, like, a pretty long discussion because that's, I mean, that's kind of, like, the new, modern, popular way to go about it, um, which is just totally not my thing. Like, I'm... I'm a, you know, my, uh, like my tone hammer is kind of modern, but it's a very vintage feeling amp. And like, I play a P bass into that into like 15s. Like I'm, mm -hmm. I'm about as vintagey as you can get on the bass tone side. And it, uh, yeah, I just, I just get kind of annoyed sometimes <laughs> when, I, when I just hear like super clanky bass tone, um, just cause like, I mean, it's not wrong, you know, everything is subjective, but it, it's just so against kind of uh, what I stand for in the bass world. Um, you have to have mids to like have a good bass tone, in my opinion. Um, but a lot of people don't agree with me, apparently. So no, and that's okay. Would you, would you say would you say that uh, that kind of slap bass is the Eagles of bass playing? Oh gosh. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'd, I'd probably put it put it somewhere in there somewhere. No, I'm not talking about the about the football team. I'm talking about the the people who destroyed country music. The Eagles. <laughs> Wait, they destroyed country music too. They destroyed pop music. They destroyed country music. Um, they destroyed large bands with three guitar players. They um, they destroyed Joe Walsh. Um, did, they, did they destroy MTV Unplugged? Weren't they on MTV Unplugged? Oh well, God. when they were on it, they destroyed it actively. Yes. Oh yep. <laughs> yes. That's so a, that's a very strong opinion about the Eagles. I really I, dislike. Uh, them. I I appreciate it. I mean, I I appreciate a good, you know, part of uh, part of the fun of life is, um, you know, you you got stuff you love, and then you also got stuff you don't like. Yep. The Eagles are almost the, are are worse than Fleetwood Mac, and so I would say like like that sort of thing that uh, that bass playing where it's where it's like lead solo type bass playing that style of jazz bass playing there where they're lead, doing too many leads and stuff like that and they're not holding down the bass line that would be the Fleetwood Mac of bass playing, but but 
<laughs> well, just leave Lindsey Buckingham alone. He's suffering yes. now. <laughs> 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 Lindsey, you mad at me? <laughs> oh, you want a cake, Lindsey? Guess somebody should go. <laughs> All right. Well, that's, you know, I, I got to thank Tim for that. That was a really interesting little jag. Because I, I got to agree, man. Because if, if a bass player isn't playing bass, man, why are you doing that? You know? Yeah. What, uh, what are you doing there? You're supposed to hold it down. And if you don't hold it down, you're not playing bass. You know? Yeah. I'm a pocket guy through and through. So, oh, I mean, yeah. I, there's, there's a time and place for things. But most of the time, if you just have a P bass and a good amp and you play in the pocket it'll work like yeah 99 percent of the time you know you're in a situation where we're like that's kind of just what would make sense so sure yeah and it's not 2002 anymore that's just not cool <laughs> so albert on the topic of you playing bass in bands i saw a picture of you that playing on stage and, and you were wearing what appeared to have been a safari hunter's outfit um, where do you draw your inspiration for your outfits? Um, so actually, uh, kind of the, it, you know, it's, it's evolved over the years a little bit. Um, and now my kind of new aesthetic that I'm going for, think seventies Miami private detective. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's, that's kind of, kind of like the feel that I, you know, my, minus like suspenders and I'm probably not going to wear, you know, like a lot of the same, like. Well, I mean, I guess if they're a Miami one, they wouldn't be wearing a lot of like sports coats or like trench coats and stuff because you know it's hot. But uh, but yeah, that's 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 kind of where I'm where I'm trying to land right now. You know, I kind of switch switch things up every uh, every couple of months. But yeah. the like super unbuttoned Hawaiian shirts and all that those those are like my one thing that stays true. <laughs> well, and, and seriously, that I think that's rad because I always was like a fan of Cheap Trick. Just because you had like the two rock star looking guys in the band, you know, the lead singer and the bass player, and they had the kind of the rock star look going. And then you had Rick Nielsen, you know, wearing whatever. <laughs> yeah. Totally. And then and then Bun E. Carlos playing drums with like the suspenders and the glasses and the comb, comb over. And those guys just totally being who they were. To the point where it was cool. Yeah, you know? for sure. Like, I love that vibe when people, like, do that. I think that's that's super cool to just know who you are and, like, do whatever and let it hang out. And that seems to be what your whole thing's about. So I appreciate that. Well, I appreciate that from you. <laughs> <laughs> oh. so these are, okay, uh, this these is are a lot of very nice words, guys. Daily uh, affirmations. Yeah. There yes, we go. Seriously. I that's my cool. love that's language is words of affirmation, so I'm having a real good time right now. <laughs> words of well, affirmation. we all we, we all love you, Albie. Uh, yeah. I love you guys. Well, oh. <laughs> I, I think you would be a perfect fit to come visit New Orleans though. <laughs> oh, I, I think I'd fit in real nice in New Orleans. Yes. <laughs> So bring those Sonsoid boys down, and we will uh, we will have some fun. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. Maybe uh, we can convince Tony Ropes to come out for a night. I would I would love to um, get the show him that the South can be a fun place. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Clifton Worley breaking the Southern stigma breaking the to barriers. Californians. <laughs> hey y'all, I'm breaking the barriers down. Breaking the barriers. <laughs> Tony Ropes don't drink. <laughs> <laughs> All right. He, he had one shot of soju one night. Yeah. Because <laughs> I kept bugging him. <laughs> well, he, okay. Not, not in a peer pressure kind of way. I'm not that kind of yeah. guy. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, to Tony Ropes is the most chill guy. and um, it's, But I had to get back at him for uh, calling me out on the podcast, on the, on the Gear Slum. <laughs> but it, it's all in fun. Tony, so I will, I'll try not to harass you anymore on the, on the IMs, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to though. <laughs> yeah, now all of the listeners of the show are going to do that. So I, I know no, no, they're they're nice people for the most part, <laughs> except for those it, that like Eagles. We'll put it in the show description. Go talk to Tony at <laughs> sign us up on chat. Okay. Tell him Clifton, tell him Clifton Whirly yeah. sent you. And they'll think they're getting a discount, but they're not. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do ask that, for Tony guys. Ropes. 
<laughs> As for Tony Ropes, exactly. <laughs> Hashtag Tony Ropes in the message. Oh, man. And you will get 10% off your order. And oh, that it won't happen at all. <laughs> Guys, come on. Come on. Let's chill That's about funny. that. That's funny. Okay. Uh, well, anyway. moving on, uh, we've got the Mojo Minute coming up. Coming up or right now? Right now. <laughs> That isn't my Mojo Minute guitar, though. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, so today on the Mojo Minute, um, I know you. I told you guys I bought a parlor guitar from Goodwill. Um, I put a the Goodwill auctions. I finally put a bid on a seven ninety nine, no namer, parlor. Um, all the decals were gone, so I didn't know what it was. Um, I asked them for more pictures of the neck, and it didn't look bowed or anything. Um, so yeah, I, I ended up winning the guitar, um, at $7 and 99 cents. So I was actually pretty <laughs> pumped about it. Cause I was like, no matter what, you know, in, even at $20 shipped, I was like in handling, I was like, okay, well I'll call this an experiment for goodwill auctions and I'll see for one, we didn't know how they shipped. We didn't know anything about what they did or if it, you know, cause I figured it would just show up loose in a cardboard box with a little bit of bubble wrap and, you know, it would be ruined by the time it got here. So I was like, okay, so that's at least an experiment. And then, you know, two, what kind of condition are these guitars in, you know, for Goodwill auctions and stuff. So, well, I didn't hear back from them after I ordered it. I didn't even get a confirmation like that they were shipping for like four days. So huh. I opened up what you do with Goodwill auctions is you open up a ticket and I don't think anybody cares. Like, um, I, I, I opened up a kit ticket. It was with Texas Goodwill and I was like, okay, Hey, are you going to ship this? Cause I haven't gotten any confirmation from FedEx or anything. So finally, um, they never responded to me. Um, I got on Saturday, they finally, I got, I got the confirmation that they shipped it and it, it would be here, um, today. Well, it ended up coming in two days early. Um, and I got the guitar and they shipped it. I'll tell you this. I mean, it was it was shipped like last fall. I mean, it had it was in a box. It was in a, a perfect the perfect size box. It was completely covered in bubble wrap. They pre-detached the neck and broken What's off. <laughs> well, let you Les Paul, you got it. You shipped it like a Les Paul, so they so the neck's broken off on it. <laughs> <laughs> no, the neck was fine. Um, <laughs> And actually, I wish it would have been broke because then I would have tried to, like, get insurance or something on it. And I probably would have been worth more than the guitar. Oh um, but the uh, it was completely bubble wrapped. It was it was wrapped beneath the bubble wrap. It had bubble wrap around the bubble wrap in the box. There was more in the shipping than there, this guitar was even worth. So yeah. I was like, OK, well, so that's legit. If you want to order a guitar from Goodwill Auctions, it's going to come, you know, you're you're it's going to be well packaged and you don't have to worry about anything like that. Um, I didn't have to sign for it or anything. Uh, so sweet. I got it in the house. I, op I opened it up. It had been in the cold. So I let it sit around and, and let it warm up. And then I opened it up and, and, uh, I'm like, Oh, cool. You know, and I, I, I first, the, the strings were slack, which was good. But then when I thought about it and they were pretty old, I thought about it and I was like, that means the strings were probably slack in the picture too. Like, oh, I don't no. think I don't think Goodwill intentionally slack the strings to send it to me. <laughs> oh, man. So that would mean that the action probably isn't what I think it is. And of course, I didn't see anything about a truss ride on the neck. Usually those old parlors have like steel reinforced neck on them. Mm -hmm. And uh -huh. this, this one didn't. So I was like, and no, there was no mark for st a sticker there. And there were other marks for stickers and stuff like that. And the only thing on the inside of the guitar said G100. So I was like, um, all right, there's no trust rod on this guitar. So I got it. I, I pretty much figured that if I strung this thing up, it was going to bow. And it did. Um, I put I put a set of string joys on there. Um, and... Uh, which were also worth more than the guitar. And, uh, <laughs> the nut was pretty bad. It was plastic. So I, I had a new bone nut in it laying around and I'm like, all right, I got to take this nut off. And I put the, the new bone nut fit it perfectly and I wasn't doing anything with it anyway. So I put it on there um, and uh, cleaned the guitar up. And, you know, the kids thought it was really cool looking and, and whatnot. Well, the bridge, 
I don't even think the bridge is wood. I think the bridge is like plastic and then oh. it's got like, or a composite. And then it's got a, a plastic saddle in it that's adjustable. You can move it up and down and that goes back into a floating bridge or a floating tailpiece. Um, the problem is that you, the floating tailpiece, like you can actually like kind of beat on it and get like a tremolo effect out of it. <laughs> Like it's not, it's not a very good tailpiece. Like it's not like a solid tailpiece. It's like, you know, I could probably put a resonator tailpiece on there and it would be better. And the bridge is also not floating. The bridge is actually glued down to the top of the guitar. So it's not intonating at all. Like yeah. this thing <laughs> needs to be intonated. It go, it sounds out of tune all the time. And what I need to do is I have to take a hairdryer. I think what I'm going to do is just take a hairdryer and uh, loosen up that glue and knock the bridge off. And then I'm going to move it back and repin it. Um, but what I but it doesn't matter because the neck is bowed kind of like a, it's like a banana. I mean, it, <laughs> the strings like you could limbo underneath the 12th fret like this thing has got at least, you know, I would say a few centimeters there. Like it's, it's, I can bang the slide against it. It's, it's almost like I actually have been playing it like a lap guitar. Yeah. Like it, it actually sounds, but I can fret up to like the fifth fret. Like that's fine. Um, but what I ended up having to do, the, the, the tuners are terrible. The guitar wouldn't stay in tune. And then the intonation issues, like it would go out of tune immediately. So I had to actually, what I, what I realized is that, I had these strings on there and I had it tuned to open D, but the strings were pretty bulky and it was actually pulling up the neck. So it wouldn't stay in tune because it kept pulling up the neck. So I had to back the neck like it wasn't made for strings that heavy. So and that's just a normal set of light string joy acoustic strings. So I actually lowered it down to C and um, that helped it. And now it's kind of settled, but the bridge is still all messed up and it needs to be intonated and I need to push it back. So I am, uh, I think that's what I'm going to do, but either way, you know, it's a seven, it's a $7 guitar. If I hung it on the wall, you know, I'd be getting my money out of it. You know, it looks cool. Um, and there is, uh, there is a few more things I could do to it, and I think I will. I think this would be a good guitar to practice, maybe even a neck reset. Of course, if it doesn't have a truss rod in it, I don't know if I can reset the neck. Yeah. Um. Yeah. It's it's probably not gonna sit. It's not gonna stay. Um. Because there's nothing keeping that neck from from coming forward. Uh. And but I, what I can at least do is I can pop the bridge off and then do that to it. But it actually has a pretty cool sound. Um. I posted a video on Instagram. And I'll put something on the on the FB page too, but it's got a weird like resonator sound. And when I when I pick the guitar up, I, I kind of like I feel like an old blues player like that that you know came out of poverty and like didn't have a guitar laying around. Maybe somebody oh, gave yeah. it to me. Yeah. And it's got that boxy finger picking sound, and it's it's got that really old timey blues sound to it. And you know I can pretty much get through one one song or playing it for you know five minutes before i have to tune it up again but it it's got a really cool mid-range honk sound to it and kind of what i what i'm taking from this is that i really would like to have a guitar that has that sound and um that's why i'm kind of like thinking about the recording king dirty 30 or maybe even the um jim dandy yeah again just because that's a really unique sound most of my guitars like my the the Stella, I just played. That one's really bright and trebly and crisp, and that's that birch wood. But this guitar is the complete opposite, and um, I think it's just, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's pretty. I'm not. I'm not really. I'm not dissatisfied with it for what I paid. But I think you just got to. If you're going to look at an old guitar on um, on Goodwill site, try to stick with something name brand. Like go for like I won't go for another one that's not like a, a K or a Harmony or something like that. Um, but I think there are a lot of cool projects on that on that site. So uh, you know I don't know I'm not too upset. But yet here's the difference in sound that I was talking about. <laughs> tell it's already been sitting here and it's already gone out of tune yeah so <laughs> it's got that real cool like um honky mid-range sound though and uh 
I like it. Um, I actually thought about raising the nut up on it and putting like I have one of those old um, nut extenders on it that are metal. And um, I've got like a, a steel laying around somewhere. And I was thinking about playing it like a Dobro um, once I get the other issues figured out. But um, yeah, I don't know. Lesson learned. So that's the that's two that's two things of bad news I had this week. I had my Ibanez pedal that was <laughs> just broke. And then this guitar came in and it was not what I expected. So, yeah. I'm uh, I'm out a little bit of money, 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 and uh, stuck with two things that I really probably won't lose too much or use too much. So, yeah, <laughs> that's all right, yeah. though, man. If well, you're gonna I'll take, tell you, well, well, take you, chance, just need to, part- you need to save your money and come to now next year. Yeah, <laughs> save my money and come to. <laughs> that's I went it. to my own. I went to my own Nam last week. That it's funny that Nam falls on um, the traditional bow hunters expo. Oh, okay, and. Uh, I worked the floor of that all day Saturday, and you know there's like over a thousand traditional archers there, so it uh, that was pretty fun. Um, that's why I was laughing when you guys were all there. I was taking pictures walking around the the expo, and I was like, "Oh, I'm." It's funny how they end on the same day or on the same day, yeah. But uh, or weekend, but yeah. Um, I'll probably I'll probably try again with the. With the goodwill thing, um, I'll just make sure I know what I'm looking at. The two I actually did not win before this one because I, I just let them run out of time were probably better guitars. Um, you know, they were actually name brand stuff. But I think anything with like the steel reinforced neck on it would be fine. Mm-hmm. Um, what you have to be careful, though, is do you want to get something from the 60s because those are the ones that are solid wood? Um, this one I'm pretty sure is not solid wood. I don't know. I don't know what it is. It feels like it's balsa wood or something. Mm-hmm. Um but anyway, like I said, um, they can't all be winners, and that's just part of be playing the game. It's part of the fun, you know? Yeah. So, well, that's that's the Mojo Minute for this week, guys. Cool. Um, well, in closing, um, I want to thank uh, Albert for coming on the show this week. And um, I just had a good time hanging out at NAMM, and... Um, Hopefully we'll see each other again here at uh, at that summer now, and uh, so. Anyways, I'm gonna let you guys go, but um, I had fun chatting about uh, just recovering now, and then going to the Mojo Minute, and uh, we'll uh, talk to you guys later. Bye, guys. Yes. Yeah. Thanks a lot, guys. Glad I got the chance to be on here. Yes. So, thank you. Nice to talk to you. Overlating my ego a little bit too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, later. Ah.